No cuts till Christmas, or as I kept hearing in my head all day, no cuts till Christmas. I don't know. That's I get our, it. I get our it, next, Julie. Our next guest oh, no. thinks that <laughs> after a string of hotter than expected inflation reports, for more, we're talking to Blake Gwynn, head of U.S. rate strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Is that the song you had that's in your head? That's what I was going for. <laughs> yeah, yes, I'm glad we were on the same page with that. Um, so, you know, this is sort of the Bostic view, if you will, that perhaps we'll get a cut in the fourth quarter of this year. That's where we're at today. And do you think that Jay Powell was acknowledging that today? Yeah, and I think, you know, you said it correctly before. I mean, he's kind of marking to market to some extent. Mm-hmm. And I think we've already heard a bit of this shift in rhetoric from other Fed speakers since that March CPI print, you know, Collins, Daly, um, Jefferson today. So some of the other more kind of centrist members and even some of the people that tend to lean dovish, you're seeing them kind of back away from this bump in the road narrative where they're, they were kind of trying to write off the January strength and in inflation as idiosyncratic, something that was going to correct, uh, get back to that kind of uh, a Q4 2023 trend. Um, but I think we've seen those speakers back away from it. And then Powell basically confirmed that shift today. He didn't try, I think, even once to really kind of sell that January data, the strength that we've seen in Q1 as you know, a bump in the road. And are you saying you know, the one cut you're looking for in December, is that just because November, forget it, just too politically sensitive? Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of it. So you know, we had originally been to three cuts, and, and I've been a big um, advocate for the fact that you know, politics aren't going to play a role in what the Fed decides to do. That was probably more true when they were going to start that process in mm. June. I think there's a big gap between uh, continuing a cutting process that's already in place. I think that's very justifiable to the public, to Congress, to say, hey, we told you there were going to be three cuts. We, we started it in June. We're going every other meeting. You know, it's, it's, it's very defensible. And I think it gets a lot more difficult when you're starting that process right in the heart of the election cycle. And the other thing I would say is that what we've always been talking about uh, is really an adjustment process. It's preventative cuts. You know, this isn't a forced reaction to deterioration in the data or you know, uh, responding to some kind of exogenous geopolitical shock or something. This was preventative. It's, it's a nice to have. It's not a need to have. If that's the case, I think starting it and kicking it off right in the middle of the election, it, it's, it's bringing a lot of potential heat onto the mm-hmm. Fed for no real upside. Because in the end, 25 basis points in September, November, it, it's not going to be the make or break between a hard landing or a soft landing. What is at this point? I mean, you know, if they have kept policy as tight as it has been for as long as it's been now, and it hasn't brought down inflation, and we keep seeing these inflation prints, why is leaving it where it is now going to achieve the goal? I mean, I think that's a lot of the, you know, the, the questions that are being asked. I mean, we put out a piece uh, several months ago just talking about how you know, rate hikes this time haven't really worked the way we thought. And there's some idiosyncratic reasons related to the pandemic. Uh, you know, we had this big wave of uh, fiscal support. I think a lot of people, a lot of businesses were able to kind of term out debt, reduce their exposure to interest rates. So, um, you know, we had very clean balance sheets coming into this. Um, fiscal policy kind of remains stimulative. So I, I think there's just a lot of things going on that have kind of dulled uh, the impact that these rate hikes have had. And so I think part of the rethink going on inside the Fed right now is what exactly is a neutral policy rate? Is, is the rate setting that we currently have, is it as restrictive as they once thought that it would be? Um, I think at least with the data we've seen so far, the answer to that would probably be no. Right. And Blake, just looking at the tenure here, you know, we backed up to 4.66. Six. Do you think we test that October high of 5%? Where, where do you think we had kind of near intermediate term? Yeah, so I, I still lean against testing that 5% level. I think if you think about where we were in August and September of last year, it's definitely a different place. I mean, we were still pricing in some probability uh, of, a, of another hike in the cycle. Um, you know, we had this backdrop of uh, Treasury supply. If you remember, there was a lot of angst about uh, a supply-driven term premium um, you know, rise. I think that came on the back of that August refunding when Treasury said, hey, you know, deficits, their, their announcement showed deficits uh, bigger than expected, uh, funding needs bigger than expected. So um, they were also increasing the size of, you know, Treasury uh, auctions. So I, I think that kind of served as a backdrop. I don't think the supply itself really matters that much. I think it's more that everybody was concerned about the supply at the same time as you had hot data and possibility of a cut. If you look at now, I think what's different is the bar to another cut is very, very high. Um, I think on the supply side, we're starting to see another some- hike, The bar to another hike. Uh, bar to another hike, I'm yeah. sorry, thank you. Um, so, so that is very, very high. I don't think we're you know, really entertaining that. It's not really priced in you know, maybe 20, 30% into markets. Um, I think on the supply side, you're starting to hear some more discussions around that deficit issue, but 
Um, you know, we do have a refunding announcement in, in a few weeks. Um, our expectation, this is going to be a very strong tax season. If anything, I see possibility that uh, deficit expectations are actually marked down. Um, and also, uh, at least in our forecast, and I think Treasury's been fairly clear in communicating this, they're not increasing their coupon auction sizes for some considerable amount of time. So you kind of take that, I think, out of the backdrop. And I do wonder if that refunding is actually going to help kind of cool markets, help settle us into this kind of new higher range without really retesting uh, that you know high from, from, from late last year. Mm. Do you think there's going to be adequate, adequate demand for the upcoming auctions? There was a 10-year auction this recently that was... Yeah, we've had some tails, but overall, I mean, I think, you know, even as Treasury has increased all of these auctions, you know, they went on this campaign where they increased auction sizes for multiple quarters. Um, overall, we've taken it down pretty well. I think you've had some individual auctions that maybe go, you know, better or, or poor, but um, overall, uh, you know, we've come out of those situations with, with yields in pretty good shape. One of the, you know, worst 30-year auctions I remember, everybody said, oh, this is, you know, it, it had a huge tail. Everybody said, this is it. We can't take it down. By the end of the week, we were unchanged on 30-year yields. So it's tough for me to really think that, that that's a huge problem. Makes sense. Blake, thanks for coming in. Good yeah, to see you. you. Appreciate see you it.